Today on CityCast Denver, we all know the smell. It wafts around Globeville and Five Points with that sort of rich, meaty thickness. Even though the Purina pet food plant has been around for 90 years, complaints about its smell have been skyrocketing. So we've got science journalist Trish Zornio on today because yes, it stinks. But is it a health problem? Today is Thursday, February 22nd. I'm Bree Davies, and here's what Denver's talking about. Trish Zornio, welcome to CityCast Denver. Thanks so much for having me. So before we get started, I just want to say that we uh, reached out to Purina for an interview and they denied our request for, I'm sorry, for a tour of the plant. We tried to check out what was going on. So instead, I'm going to start by playing a clip that's the sort of closest thing that I think we got to the source of the smell. Um, It's from the director of the Environmental Quality Division within the Denver Public Health and Environment. Uh, This is Greg Thomas. In the pet food manufacturing process, You generally mix together ingredients, uh, including water, right? And and what you do is you extrude, you know, like a a paste. And for the dry kibble, that paste comes out. It's cut into pellets. It moves along a conveyor belt through a dryer. The steam, the moisture within those pellets then exhausts out the top of the facility. So just... um... That's pretty d- disgusting, I think, when we th- we hear this description of it. But but is this a problem? Well, I know my cat liked it a lot. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I you know I think the problem is that we have communities that are living around a facility that is then uh, completing a process that you know does need to be done. You know the, these pets obviously need food, just as we need food, and so that's that's not so much the issue entirely, but the issue is that it is nearby to communities that are breathing in this air. So why did you want to look into this? Because I have to say, it's it's something that's, I don't want to say it's a joke or a trope about Denver, or at least that part of the, the city, but it's something that folks talk about. You know, I drove, I drove down the highway and I smelled this thing. What is it? Or I lived in this neighborhood or I, you know, I know when it's processing because the wind is blowing. Like what, what got you interested in finding out what was going on? Yeah, I think, you know, so this really came out of uh, chats with my editor. We were talking about what I had been covering for the last year or two. uh, And it had largely dominated around the environmental issues related to pollution from Suncor. And there were good reasons for that. And then we asked the question, what has not been able to be covered because there has been so much going on with Suncor? What other issues related to environmental pollution have we not been able to cover? And what can we dive into more there? And that was actually where we started asking the question, well, what are the residents of these areas experiencing? And so I started asking around, and the number one complaint that actually kept coming back was odor. Well, where is the odor coming from? The number one complaints that we were getting Purina. And for folks that maybe don't know, geographically, we're talking about the Suncor oil refinery, which is also in this this neighborhood in, in Globeville area, Swansea. It's in proximity to it. So it is something that the residents have dealt with for a very long time. So you have a background in science. I do. Um, you looked into the actual science of this issue. Do you have a sense of what the problem is beyond sort of just like a, a nuisance Yeah. So I think the thing that really struck me and and made me fascinated in pursuing this story is because usually the ones that I I take on are with that sort of science lens and perspective. And in the odor pollution conversation, there are two things that really struck me. And the first one is, how do we actually define an odor pollution and how do we regulate it? And the second aspect of that is, does it actually have health concerns? And that's why it's in part regulated differently. So let's look at the first one, right? So what is an odor pollution? How do we measure it? Well, that seems very subjective to some extent to me. And it turns out that they do have a somewhat uh, regulated process on how that would go. And it is that when there is a complaint submitted, somebody is dispatched as a sniffer with, with an instrument that goes out and dilutes the air that is problematic sevenfold. So you have a seven to one dilution. If that certified sniffer. So if they they are trained and they are, uh, if they can still smell the smell after a sevenfold dilution, then it is considered to possibly be in violation. Huh. So it's not just walk out, do I smell it? Sure. (laughs) 
and, and at no point was able to determine why seven was the number. <laughs> I, it, it's unclear to me. Everybody said, I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, perhaps somebody knows, but I have not. And if you do know, contact me, but uh, it hasn't come out just yet. And, but that is how we do it. And so there are a couple of issues with that from a scientific standpoint, because if you're talking about a, a regulating something, um, you need something that has teeth, right? So uh, if a call complaint comes in and you have no continuous monitoring, so you have to get somebody and they have to be dispatched and it might be several days later. The situation could the be The situation over. might not even be what you're measuring, right? Um, and then, you know, the second fold of, well, there are sensitivities and subjectiveness to how people might experience those odors. People with certain conditions might be more prone, et cetera, right? And then if you go back to the second thing, which is that health concern versus annoyance. So if you say, okay, well, that's just annoying <laughs> because it doesn't smell very good. And maybe it's a little bit funny, right? Because you're like, oh, the cat food, the dog food. Yeah, it's um, just a gross smell. Just a gross smell, right? Sure. So like, and that is annoying. But is it a health problem? But is it a health problem? And and what's interesting is that, um, you know, we know from, and even the CDC website openly has in their toxicity program, you know, they openly have that odor pollutions absolutely can, particularly for certain groups, cause some types of health concerns. And the interesting thing is that if you look at some of the literature, and I, I talked with some of the scientists who were doing this literature, you have, okay, well, mental health and well-being being described as general well-being annoyance under the category of annoyance or depression being categorized as annoyance versus an actual health concern. When we know for a fact that you biologically, like depression or symptoms related to general well-being and mental health are actually biologically driven, and they can have real health impacts beyond the brain. And so for me, when I look at that with my background, especially being in neuroscience, you know, I, I really shudder at the idea of calling things that are clearly impacting people's quote unquote well-being or mental health as not being health concerns because those are absolutely physical. And that's a more modern understanding of mental health I'm just thinking about this in a different way now because, A, I've, I've been pregnant before, and I will tell you uh, I was nauseous for nine months straight on top of any time I smelled anything that was, like, mildly discomforting. It was like, yeah, it, it, I, I may have vomited, these, you know, these different things that you're talking about. So I'm just thinking about all these day-to-day -day things that someone might be experiencing, but there's no right. – uh, nothing to back it up. Uh, at least in the regulations or the policy around how that is. I don't know. This is so, it is so much more complicated than just it stinks over here. Well, and it's it's even more than than that, right? It's even more than just the smell not being pleasant or maybe sure. even having some mild implications for health and sometimes moderate implications for health because the, the second component of that health thing is that a lot of times you're looking at that as a single source pollutant, right? So you're, oh, one time I was exposed to this unpleasant odor. Well, that's very different than day in, day out, living in a place that has consistent unpleasant odors and combined with other environmental pollutions that we know are happening from other sources and it's being concentrated into this area, right? So when you start thinking about it as okay, but what is the cumulative impact here? The science isn't really there yet, but I think given we know single source point pollutions aren't great, I think we could certainly hypothesize that we might have reason to be concerned about a cumulative impact. But what about when it's so strong you can't open your windows? Or what about if it's so strong you can't go for a walk? Now you're having physical impacts by the omission of being able to be physically active. So it is it, so it can what be are measured the, in different so ways. Is then. that an annoyance at that point? Mm -hmm. Because to me, if I'm not able to go for a walk around the block because it smells too bad and it's giving me a headache, sure. I don't think that's an annoyance. And I think this is where I the, the question I ended up taking away from this is are our regulations truly in line with the modern science of what we understand? <laughs> And, and is that cumulative impact something we need to be looking at more strongly? Because it's one thing if it happens once a year. But this is a continuous but it doesn't. issue. This episode is brought to you by Volo Sports. Because it's time to register for a spring league today. 
you don't know Volo Sports, they've got Denver's most popular adult sports leagues, which are great if you're new to the city and looking to meet new people or make friends, or if you're just looking for a new way to get out of the house and socialize. They've got traditional sports like soccer, basketball, volleyball, and flag football, plus more non-traditional social sports like kickball, cornhole, pickleball, bocce, and bar games. Sports you can do with beer in your hand at the same time. That's what kickball started as, for sure. There's something for everyone, even if you don't consider yourself athletic. Play seven days a week at convenient spots from Lodo, Sloan's Lake and City Park to Cherry Creek, Highlands, Uptown, DU, Arvada, Inglewood, Golden, and more. You can sign up as a full team, a small group, or a free agent. Sign up today at volosports.com. That's V-O-L-O sports.com. Hey, it's Olivia Jewell Love, producer of CityCast Denver. When I first moved here, I didn't know anyone, and listening to CityCast Denver made me feel like I had friends. That's why the mission of CityCast Denver speaks to me. We spend all day, every day, finding the most compelling stories, the most exciting people, and the best insider recommendations so that you can make the most of the city and also make the city better. Members of CityCast Denver make that possible, and we couldn't keep doing this work without you. Become a member of CityCast Denver today at membership.citycast.fm and get exclusive perks like ad-free listening, event invites, and members-only updates. That's membership.citycast.fm. Thanks. Um, I think the folks at Purina must think that it is some kind of a problem because the city recorded a spike in odor complaints around the plant at the end of last year, and the company called for a community meeting in December to address these concerns. What can you tell me about that meeting? That's correct. And, you know, I wasn't actually in attendance, but I did have a chance to speak with several of the people who were. And I think the thing that I took away the most from those conversations was actually a sense of optimism, uh, which which is not often the case in these kinds of discussions, right? So I thought that was particularly interesting that in this set of conversations, many of the people who came out felt like maybe there's a sliver of optimism for some change, in part because Purina was, from multiple accounts, the one who actually instigated that meeting. Uh, it was not actually requested. It was there was a spike, as you said, in those odor complaints in the Denver area, and Purina reached out to help facilitate community discussions. So that alone, people felt like, was a unique thing that isn't often done. Uh, so maybe that means that they are serious about engaging with us. On the other hand, the second thing that I heard was, but. Mm. That other shoe kind of dropping a little bit. We've been talking about this for a long time, and, and you mentioned it's sort of a running joke, and like, it doesn't take a lot to, to drive through that area and realize, whew, this is, this is yeah. tough, right? And so imagine being the people who are living day in. Right, versus just passing right yes. by it. <laughs> yeah. And so, so we've known about this issue clearly for a long time. And how many of us can say, whew, that's really bad. I, I would never want to live here. But people are, and they've been dealing this for a long time, and they've been talking about this for a long time. And how long has it gone largely without being addressed? And so I think there is some optimism. Maybe this is the change. There's some stuff, momentum happening around some of the Suncor stuff too, and environmental pollution and environmental justice in general. So maybe some of that is taking hold, a little bit of hope. But mm. it's been a long time. Is there really hope for change? Also, speaking of the time frame thing, we're talking about a plant that's 90 years old, right? It has been in this community for decades. Has Purina ever um, been cited for any previous violations? Yeah. Has there been anything like that? So in recent years, uh, the program facilitator was only able to think of one instance where they were able to go out and actually confirm that there had been a violation of odor pollution standards based on that 701 ratio and uh, dilution. And there was a fine that was issued by CDPHE. There hasn't been really, to their recollection, they couldn't think of anything in recent times where there had been another instance where one had been verified. And I think that stems back to that initial conversation where if something's being reported, but it's not being able to be sourced until potentially a day, two, or three later, the it's situation hard. has entirely changed by then. Um, and even if you were to deploy, you know, in that exact moment within an hour, even that could have changed. Um, and I think part of the community response has been, why aren't we even being told, you know, this day, this time, expect this, you know, can't we at the very least 
get some understanding of when it's likely to be worse uh, so that we know to plan around that. And that's the sort of thing where, okay, if that were to happen, you could have people go out and then actually test while it's happening, right? So there could be efforts that are that are possible here. I'm not aware of any to date uh, in terms of active monitoring in that sense, proactive to be clear, but it's certainly something that could be possible. Yeah, I mean it's a it's a factory. It has to be on a schedule of some kind, right? It's not they're not yeah, willy nilly making dog food whenever. I'm sure there's and I'm times sure, when it's worse. One hundred percent, and I'm I'm quite sure that Purina has some things in place that. Unfortunately, I've not been able to get more information on uh, the specifics and the details. And so that's where it would be really helpful, you know, to to know exactly what is happening there. We've been kind of dancing around this idea, I think, the whole time, which is like, who is impacted? Why has this continued to happen for decades? I do think about this as a maybe a gentrification conversation or was there an uptick in odor reports because there are newer folks to the neighborhood who are being being upset or bothered or or impacted by this smell for the first time versus folks that have lived there for decades and maybe felt like, what is anyone going to do about it? This is how my neighborhood has always been. How how, how do you see the, the gentrification conversation or at least the who is impacted by something like this kind of pollution in, in conversation with this this story that you were digging into? Yeah, I think I think what's more relevant is not even what I think, but what the people who live there think. And the the thing that I was surprised a little bit to hear, and yet not at all surprised uh, at the same time, but was a little bit of a fear that yes, we do want this addressed, but if it is addressed, is that going to impact our ability to live here financially? Right, because if this is fixed. Is the gentrification process going to be expedited? And for me, the real takeaway there is, so we are forcing these communities to feel like they have to make the choice between health or a place to live. So um, the director of the city's environmental quality division suggested that many residents uh, can get desensitized to the smell. I mean, I I guess I could see that being possible. I think about folks that live in Greeley, for instance, maybe are used to something. Not saying that that is yeah. livable, but it is. Um, what do you what do you think about that idea of being desensitized to the odor? Well, I mean, if you think about it purely from a biological standpoint, that is kind of how it works to some extent. That doesn't necessarily mean it's a good thing. <laughs> I I think that's where again I would go back to that science question of. I don't know if we really have good information on that cumulative impact when it's not just one source and when it's not just one time, but it's multiple sources over a very long period of time. I think that could possibly change the equation. And I, I think when you talk about somebody becoming desensitized, that, you know, we as humans, that is a process that is possible. But uh, is that actually a good thing from a health perspective overall? I don't know if we can really answer that well. So what do you hope listeners out there think about next time they smell that smell? Because I'm thinking about those of us that don't live there, we pass by. It's the it's the joke. But I, I don't know. You've done so much research on this. What do you, what do you hope people take from this? I, I think the hope would be that you know, it's easy to drive by and sort of laugh and be like, ooh, that's that's terrible. Gosh, can you imagine living there? And pausing when you find yourself thinking that and stopping to say, people do. These are families living in these neighborhoods dealing with this. And so the next time, you know, people are tempted to sort of make that joke, also maybe remind yourself, is there some way I can get engaged? Maybe should I submit a, an odor complaint the next time I drive through so that people know, hey, yeah, that is really unhelpful <laughs> and unpleasant. And, and maybe if I submit another one, it'll be one more reminder, hey, here's another toward that uptick. You know, that's one small way of pot potentially, you know, just thinking of the people there and trying to, to maybe do. But is that enough? Absolutely not. <laughs> um, that takes substantially more in terms of, again, writing people who represent you and all sorts of ways to sort of bring that issue further up. And it's, it's just going to take some time. Chris Arneo, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks so much for having me. 
While we did not hear back from Purina ourselves in response to our request for a tour, we did see that they offered a comment to Fox 31 last year on a similar topic. The company stated, quote, in the last decade, Purina has made significant investments to mitigate cooking aromas appropriate to our unique site layout and neighboring population increase, as well as the geography and weather patterns in Denver. These improvements have noticeably reduced the aromas from our pet food cooking processes. Love it or hate it, the odor from the Purina plant is one of Denver's signature smells. But what else makes that list? We're on the hunt for Denver's best, worst, and most Denver-y smells. Is there a spot in the city you go out of your way to sniff? Or a real stink hole you always avoid? Or maybe a smell that, good or bad, just makes you feel at home? The Denver Smells Hotline is open at 720-500-5418. Leave us a voicemail or send us a text to 720-500-5418 and you might hear it on the show. That's all for today here on CityCast Denver. If you enjoyed this show, why not take a minute to tell the Purina plant to give us a tour already? Rate the show wherever you get your podcasts and subscribe to our morning newsletter and learn more about us at denver.citycast.fm. We'll be back tomorrow morning with more news from around the city. Bye-bye. When we were at the Lunar New Year and the fireworks, like smoke was just like everywhere. And I was like, oh, we should walk out of the smoke, you guys. And my friend Luke was like, yeah, we should, but I like it. And I was like, I I also like it, but maybe we shouldn't be standing in it. It Smells good. Yeah, that like sulfury or whatever. I was like, you know, I love that. I love gasoline. I love Sharpies. I like all kinds of gross smells, but doesn't mean it's good for you to stand in them. (laughs) 